Okay, so uh, just to make it easier, I have sent you the slide. So if you can share on your side and I can just talk through things. Would that be okay? Uh, you sent me an email? Yeah. Okay, so just give me a second. Um, you want to start? So we're starting. So yeah. thank you all for attending again the second uh, seminar in the Kuhisa Get to Know Everybody series. Today, if we're lucky, we're going to have three presentations. Uh, we're definitely going to have one, which is Masum Hossein from the University of Alberta. Masum does uh, circuits, and I think he's going to explain his background a little bit and maybe what he's going to be doing during the Kuhisa project. Uh, also, uh, after this, it's going to be a 10 minute presentation and five minutes of question. After that, we're going to have Kyrus Kutulakos from the Computer Science Department here in Toronto. Uh, Kyrus has been doing a lot of work in computer uh, vision and computational photography. And he's going to, I think, be talking about the sensors he's building and how he's going to use them within Kuhisa. And then at 1.40, uh, we're going to have Sanya Findler from CS who does machine learning. Uh, a lot of applications there. Maybe she's going to describe uh, what applications they're going to be doing as part of Kuhisa. So thank you all. Enjoy. Uh, my Zoom, you can uh, you can start if you want. Okay. Uh, actually, I can see the slide. Uh, is it visible? It's uh, only visible from the live stream. Okay. Unless you want to share your uh, unless you want to share your uh, screen. No, that's okay. I'm actually on the uh, live stream. I uh, you now I can see. It. Okay. Okay. I'll just Probably put it back again. Like, I'll okay. put it back again. Just okay. give me a second. Give me a second. Do you see your slides? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. Okay. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Very well. Okay. So hi everyone, uh, thanks, thanks for uh, uh, coming to the meeting. So uh, my focus is basically looking into mixed signal way of doing computation to improve the energy efficiency needed for it. And uh, probably in the next slide I can explain a bit more uh, about what I'm trying to do. So uh, move next. Uh, yeah. Well, can you move to the next slide? There's oh, delay, yeah, so you, you can start talking. There is a little bit of delay, okay. but you can start talking. Uh, sure. Uh, so, uh, so what I'm showing here is basically two, two layers of a neural network. On the left side, uh, you have, it could be input or one of the hidden layers on the right side. Uh, the neurons are basically implementing this function. It basically listens to all the neurons on the left side through different weighting factors. So mathematically speaking, we just simply write as one of the neurons function yk is the dot product of those um, between x and the weighting factors, right? So I'm sure you guys are all familiar with it, so I won't spend too much time on this. Uh, so what the function looks like when I implement in, in hardware, it basically involves a multiplier uh, if you have n bit of input and n bit of weighting factor, you multiply them, and then you keep on accumulating them uh, n number of times because you have n number of inputs, and you have to store all the values. So that's basically is a, a huge computation that we kind of need to do for uh, this machine learning. And uh, my goal is to find a good analog mixed signal way of implementing. So let's move to the uh, next slide. So when we uh, say that we are going to do it in analog way, uh, we would still be using the basic circuits. Somehow we will try to figure out an um, analog implementation of it. So one of the things that I am showing here is 
uh, basically you can use capacitors very uh, like a passive circuit and just have few switches and eventually you will see that it can multiply two digital inputs and represent in a form of a voltage at that node so uh, assume that you have uh, n number or b number of uh, bits binary weighted capacitors connected between a node and the ground uh, first thing we do is basically a uh, discharge all the capacitors so the capacitor switches would be turned to ground and the other end will also be uh, connected to ground so the capacitor has zero voltage across it and then uh, it's completely discharged that's why i'm writing the node uh, v out is zero and q equals zero so what i do next is i'm going to uh, connect a signal source to it let's say b of a so if you if you keep on hitting the next button then the rest of the things will appear here so so once i connect uh, the output node uh, to a source say vx and then i actually connect only a fraction of the uh, capacitors to ground so let's say i am going to multiply w with an input x so w amount of capacitors will be connected to the ground so those capacitors are going to get charged and the remaining ones that i'm showing with the red uh, would be actually disconnected so you can think of the uh, the stored charge in that case is w multiplied by c and the voltage across it which is vs right and then the third step i actually disconnect the source so that's what that red arrow is showing so i disconnect the source but all the capacitors are now and so because it is disconnected to the source then there is no extra source of charge is basically whatever is stored before will be redistributed among all the capacitors so basically by equating the total amount of uh, charge we can calculate what would be the output voltage which is kind of like v out is now w over 2 to the v minus 1 of s yes. right now the next step uh, which is shown in here i again connect it to the ground and this time i actually take away uh, x number of capacitors disconnected from it so the capacitors where both sides are grounded those charge will disappear but rest of the capacitors will still hold its charge because it could not actually have a continuous current path to discharge it so the amount of the capacitor that is holding is is uh, uh, holding the charges is actually x so the uh, amount of charge now is x and the v not just flip over because the you know, positive side is turned to ground and the negative side is sort of disconnected so that will hold the voltage necessary to hold the charges uh, in x of c amount of capacitors so then comes the last step where uh, we will see um, how how the last um, w and x gets multiplied to create the voltage so if you hit next that's what it shows so now again we get get back to some sort of a, a ultimate phase where output is disconnected and all the capacitors are charged to ground so then after redistributing the charges we can equate the output voltage to be wx over 2 to the v minus 1 square of ds so the part that we are really interested in the top of w and x now if you, you could see that it is it does the multiplication but it's kind of magnitude wise it does not have the polarity built into it so what do we do to to bring the polarity into the equation we simply say the source voltage would be a function of btd and we make it the polarity bit encoded into that so it is sine of wfx and then the magnitude of it together the output voltage is kind of a multiplication of the two digital inputs right so th that's basically basically a good way to do the multiplication because what happens here is that we are not um, we are not using eight bits and quantizing it. We are rather just simply switching some capacitors to 
create a voltage, an unquantized version of it, right? So that that's a good way to do the multiplication. Now let's uh, let's move next and uh, talk about how can we do the accumulation in in analog domain. So what we what we basically say is that if you think of an oscillation process, basically an oscillator, it gives me sinusoidal output. But what is nice about it is that in every time it starts from a zero crossing and it returns back to the next zero crossing within which it accumulates two pi gradient, right? That's what I'm plotting as the phase. So I have voltage as an information. But rather than using the voltage, I'm using the phase as an information. And if I write an uh, output phase, then I can simply say it's going to be the accumulation uh, at a rate defined by the frequency. So if I say 2 pi f and then integrate it, it, it over a certain duration of time, that basically tells me what is the accumulated phase would be. Right? So we are sort of familiar with it. Uh, but the good thing is that this accumulation process happens in nature in a very a simple way, a lot less energy consuming than the digital accumulators and adders that we try to build. So the goal here is that somehow use this accumulation process to help us. Right? So moving to the next slide, the first thing is to understand that how we can control this accumulation process. Right? So the way we do it by a, applying a control voltage to it, right? So you kind of have to see that if I increase the control voltage, my frequency is going to increase. So if you look at the red sinusoid, it's pure is kind of shrinking. That means two zero crossing points are now getting closer, so I'm ramping at a much faster rate. Right? On the other hand, uh, if I reduce my voltage, like the green one, then my peers are spreading. So it takes longer for me to accumulate the same amount of phase. So that's the only control I have in a PCO. I can control uh, the control voltage. With that, I can change the slope at which it is going to accumulate. So equation-wise, it's basically a, the control voltage multiplied by a gain factor that converts the analog quantity to phase. That's KVCO there. And the rest of the thing remains same. So that's an integration right so now now uh, for our purpose we can do we can uh, simply do a bit more than that we basically uh, moving next uh, we will be uh, having a voltage that sort of changes over time right so if this control voltage starts changing over time then we want to know uh, how the phase is being at so we start with a voltage, say, a V control plotted on the top, which is a bit higher voltage. So my fields are uh, narrower, and I am going to ramp at a faster rate. Then my voltage drops. Then you see the green line kind of uh, ramping at a slower rate. And again, in, in the last phase, is somewhere in between. So what ends up happening during the whole process, if I look at the accumulated phase at the output, it is essentially an integration. Right? So it is essentially integration of my control voltage, but to make it easier, I can have my integration periods equal, delta T, in each of those. And then what basically comes out is basic, uh, my uh, a correction factor, which is A, and then sort of a gain factor and summation of all the periods, right? So. Uh, just to make things simpler, we can simply say A plus G and summation of all the VIs, right? So that that basically tells me that I can accumulate a quantity, and then eventually, if we move to the next slide, then you can see that I can not only accumulate it, uh, probably I want that accumulated value to be digitized, right? So once uh, the phase comes out of it, I need to find a way to go back to my digital domain. And the very simple way to do that is, is to use a counter. So this counter in this case is counting the number of edges uh, in it, right? So the output of the counter is basically tells me the number of edges, which is basically indicator of, of how much phase I have accumulated. 
calculated over time. So I do have uh, my uh, face, and it's in the, in its digital form, right? So now, you know, let's move to the next. Uh, you can see where I'm going with it. So I have an accumulator, right? And I also previously made the multiplier. So if I put them together, I basically have the functionality needed for multiplication and accumulation, right? From the left side, I take two digital value. And through switching those capacitor, I get a voltage, which is multiplication of that. Then I accumulate them in the phase domain. And so I count, and then I count the number of edges, so I get D out, which essentially is reflective of all the multiplication and accumulation, if I can do things properly, right? So that, that's the whole idea of building a, a analog domain multiplication and accumulation, right? So what, what we can do here now, you can move on and see that if the implementation and how it is different than what we do. So if you move to the next slide. So, okay. So that basically shows how we are implementing it, right? So uh, the left and the right side of the red line are the digital. In between, we're doing things in analog domain, but it, at the end, the goal is come back to the digital domain. So there are many ways to do the analog computation. Uh, the reason this one is interesting for us, we are using the analog computation using digital elements, right? And uh, you already saw the capacitor and switches. Those are readily available in any digital circuit. Now, oscillator is basically a chain of information. Right? Nothing different than that. And the counter is basically D flip flops. Right? So all these circuits, uh, and we prefer it this way, because uh, the analog, traditional analog blocks by, like op-amp, charge pump, those don't scale very well uh, with the digital technology nodes like 7 nanometer or so. So we want to do the analog computation because it's energy efficient, but we want to implement it using digital ways so that it scales well we can make them available to go in the same flow of digital information, right? So that's that's why it, we are interested in it. Now, now, one of the things, if it comes to mind, moving to the next slide, is the quantization error, right? How quantization error happens in this process with relative to oh, what people are doing in now, right? So in a in a regular digital process, rounding happens after the multiplication you can round, and then after the addition you can round, and then once you move to the next stage, you also have a rounding. In our case, actually, the rounding does not happen in any intermediate step. It actually happens at the very last stage when we go to the phase to digital or time to digital domain. So that's one quantization penalty that we give. The second part is that I can actually adjust the resolution by adjusting the physio frequency. Because if I put it at a higher frequency, then it will give me more edges and I will get higher resolution. Whereas if I dial it down, then I have fewer edges, so my resolution goes down. There is no extra hardware penalty, like I do not have to design for a wider bus, right? So th those are uh, that allows me the same hardware to be reconfigured for learning mode as well as for inter uh, parents, right? inference. So it, it does allow those uh, those sort of things, but there are a couple of noise sources that kind of comes with, it, and I'll, I'll talk about it. Uh, and let's talk about the noise source, right? So what happens is that the number of bits, the way we say in a regular case is not the same in this computation because uh, what we call in these cases is effective number of bits, right? So the effective number of bits represent how many actual computing bits uh, that I can rely on. Although I may have eight bits, it's not always going to be eight bits. Probably the accuracy would be less than that. It will be more like six bits. Um, that, that may be okay. That's uh, sort of a rounding error that will be there. 
in any digital computation, but we also have some analog type noise, uh, such as phase noise. So the good thing about this type of noise is that it's a random process. And I kind of reference two papers here, uh, actually from uh, Bengio's group. Uh, they, they are showing that if you have lower resolution and if you have some sort of stochastic noise in it, the convergence during the learning phase is actually better. That's kind of, uh, and that's the same conclusion came from IBM. And I am showing one of the plots there on the right, but it shows uh, the training epoch and how it converges. As you can see, with the lower resolution, sometimes the convergence doesn't happen. Like you can see one of the curve go, go, runs away, right? But if I have some stochastic noise, that helps convergence. So we kind of have to see hey, how this random noise may not be such a bad idea, right? So that's, that's I guess, uh, all I have. I guess I am also uh, out of time. Thank you, Mastron. Uh, I don't know if we have uh, time for questions. Uh, I have a very quick question. Maybe we can take one or two. Sorry for yeah. talking that to everybody. So my question is, are you targeting uh, area? Are you targeting energy? Are you targeting uh, speed or all of the above? Uh, uh, sorry, just to make sure that I understand it. So you are asking, like, what is, what is that we are targeting? Uh, so we are targeting a, at least 10x improvement in energy efficiency. We are targeting reconfigurability. Sorry, I didn't, uh, I didn't get the last part. Okay, uh, we are also targeting the reconfigurability so that this unit during learning and inference can be reconfigured to different resolution and as such, right? Okay. And in, in terms of speed, are you going to be competitive with the distal one? Or you, uh, be more energy efficient only. Uh, in terms of speed, we are thinking if, if this thing can do things in like uh, 100 megahertz or so, that probably it should be good enough based on what I see in terms of uh, what people are publishing. Obviously, probably the speed thing is uh, application dependent. So we are not sure about that. And that's why we need help from, from the people who are kind of designing the system, they could tell us and help us define the spec for the speed and what makes sense. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Let's see if there's anything in the live chat. Just give me a second. If you're on the live stream, please use the chat there to post the question. If there are none, we can move with the heroes who is here. You have slide, slides, please? Yeah, I do. You send them to this is? Uh, I've got one more for No. How are we going to do that? <laughs> can you email them to this is? I can go ahead if I can't uh, use my phone. Yeah, but probably can. Is this, uh, is this is okay? You're going to be able to stream? Uh, yeah, with the camera. Okay. Yeah. So it's a bit faces the. Oh, do you want to be part of it? Part of the video? Yeah, it's good. Yeah, this is good. Yeah. I mean, he has a perspective, but it's like Star Wars on the side. I see. Okay. All right, so I am curious with the and I'm not a computer architect. I actually work in computational imaging, and my main focus has been uh, techniques for uh, 3D sensing. Uh, and you can think of these as potentially techniques that could be used for capturing data that could be used for, for machine learning as input. Uh, but I'm not, uh, 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 at this point, uh, targeting uh, 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 systems that uh, basically learn. Uh, I mean, I'm not working on machine learning myself. I'm just providing input to these algorithms. So I wanted to talk about two pieces of work that are basically the 
sort of a jumping off point for uh, some of the work that we'll be doing under Cohesa. Um, and uh, these projects are basically, uh, the, the sort of the theme is to, oops, I'm not sure what this is so the, the, uh, the, main, uh, the main theme of this work is uh, trying to develop sensors, 3D sensors, that uh, work very, very efficiently. That is, they work with very little power. So one of the uh, uh, main uh, ways in which uh, 3D sensors today operate is by sending light out from, uh, from, a, from the sensor. The light sort of interacts with the environment, it gets reflected, comes back onto a, a, an imaging chip, um, and then the information uh, uh, between the light that gets sent off and the light that it received is correlated in order to get information about distances. Uh, so this, of course, requires sending light out, which means you need a light source, which means that the light source requires power, and especially if you're operating outdoors, uh, there is a potentially need for significant power in order to overcome effects such as the sun, things like that. So I just wanted to give some uh, uh, sort of basic overview of some of the sensors that we've been using. They're sort of new techniques. I'm not going to talk so much about how they work, is about the kinds of results that we're getting. So this is uh, one of the uh, earlier prototypes we, we built. This is actually in collaboration with Carnegie Mellon. Um, and uh, basically, this is a sensor that consists of two components. There is a projector. It's actually a, a very low power uh, Pico projector. It basically has a laser beam that gets scanned across the field of view. Uh, you can buy that from Amazon for about 500 bucks. Um, and this is a camera. Um, which uh, has basically the same behavior as pretty much uh, every camera in the cell phone, which is basically, these are so-called rolling shutter cameras. They expose every row uh, individually and sequentially. Uh, um, and we basically combine the rolling shutter camera and a scanning laser projector um, and control the timings, the relative timing between the two devices, in order to be able to capture only the light that we want. So in particular, you can imagine that when you're capturing an image from the camera, there's two kinds of light that, that the camera receives. There is light coming from the ambient environment, um, as well as light that's coming from, uh, that, that originated from the, from the projector itself, which is what we care about. And what we would like to be able to do is to only capture this light and not the light that's sort of coming from ambient sources. That's a hard problem, uh, but we do have a way to reject that light uh, optically. Uh, so that uh, it never influences our design. So again, there's a raster scanning projector, there is a, actually it's either one or two cameras that we use depending on the situation, and some timing electronics. And what you're gonna see here is sort of the behavior of the system. So here we're actually, just let me just pause this for a second. So um, what you should be seeing here on the, um, uh, on the, on the, on the right, is uh, projecting a structured light pattern, basically the kind of pattern that we want uh, to, to use for depth estimation. We're projecting that directly onto a light bulb that is on. So this is a light bulb that is rated at about 1600 lumens. The projector that we're using is rated at about 30. And yet uh, we can still uh, get a, an image where most of the ambient light, the light coming from the, from, the, from the bulb itself, is actually rejected. So we can get a good image. The conventional camera, on the other hand, would either basically be completely flat and you wouldn't be able to see the pattern at all. And with your eyes, you just can't see this kind of thing. This is only happening because there is a very precise timing between the acquisition of a row on the camera and the projection of the corresponding row on the, on the, on the laser scanning. And the scan lines of the sensor are only exposed precisely for the time interval that the projector sends light along that scan line. So that allows us to reject most of the light. And this also works outdoors. So here we are, uh, we're in an environment where we're about a, a meter and a half away from a subject. Uh, it's about 80,000 lux, uh, and, and yet we can still see these patterns even though this is a very, very low power projector. So once, once we get these patterns, we can, capture, uh, we can capture 3D geometry, and again, we can do this for very, very bright sources. So uh, this, uh, this uh, sort of uh, uh, type of sensor uh, follows what's called the triangulation principle. So you have basically a projector and a camera that are sort of displaced physically, and you're trying to establish correspondences between a pixel of the camera and a pixel of the projector to intersect these rays in space, and that gives you distance. And, and we were successfully able to show, to, to demonstrate uh, uh, this very energy efficient uh, behavior on, on a triangulation based system. Then more recently, 
Oh, and, and here are some examples. Uh, uh, again, this is sort of live imaging now. The color coding here corresponds to distance. Again, this is in uh, bright sunlight. Uh, you will notice that uh, the camera that you're, that you're seeing, perhaps uh, this very high frequency pattern on the on the on the on the on the blouse of the kid and on the face. This is all coming from from the projection that we that we provide. So that gives us a lot of structure that we can use for for computing uh, depth. Here's sort of another example of that. So uh, I'm not going to go through the details of sort of analysis, but basically, uh, with an improved version of the prototype, we should be able to go to up to about seven meters in uh, well, about five five to seven meters in totally bright sunlight, which is the same power that we use in our in our current system. So that again gives us uh, the ability to operate outdoors at fairly large distances uh, for again personal 3D imaging. For uh, longer distances, we've been, uh, we built another, another version of the system that is based on the time of flight principle. So here we have a, 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 a you can think of it as a, as a modulated beam, as a modulated uh, 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 light signal that, that is sent out about uh, 100 megahertz, uh, well, 30 to 100 megahertz. And that is received back by the sensor, and we're looking at the time delay. Uh, and that gives us again a distance of time of flight, the time it takes for light to travel to a point and come back. And we've uh, basically built a similar, uh, similar device uh, that operates under this time of flight principle. We have a, a, uh, a laser which uh, sends out a stripe. Uh, that stripe uh, is sent to a mirror that basically controls its position, so we can basically illuminate individual, basically send sheets of light out into the scene. And then these are received by the time of flight sensor. Again, we have a very precise timing of the uh, outgoing light, of when the, uh, the light uh, goes over the particular plane and when that light is received by a particular scan line on the camera. And that again allows us to deal with very bright sources. So here's a, an example of uh, how we fare against uh, sort of uh, uh, conventional time of flight systems. So here's our, our target, it's just a white board. Uh, in the middle, you see what a conventional time of flight camera would do, and, and here again, color coding corresponds to distance, and then you see what our sensor gives us. So in this particular example, we're in a cloudy day, so maybe about 10 times uh, dimmer than, than bright sunlight. Uh, and uh, uh, as we move farther and farther away, uh, the, uh, the information coming from a conventional camera becomes noisier and noisier because again, there's less light that's being sent out. So you can see that as we move to about uh, nine or 10 meters away, you basically don't get anything. And this is in a cloudy day, okay? Um, if, we go to a, if we go to a sunny day, uh, let's see, what is this? This is like, still cloudy. If we go to a sunny day, basically there's no information whatsoever coming from the depth sensor, even when you're very close. Whereas with, uh, with our system, you can actually go equally far away, and again, the, uh, even though we have a very low power device, uh, we can still get a good depth information at, at a distance here of about 15 meters. Um, the, we have new and improved design of the system, which takes us to about 25. Okay. Uh, so, uh, again, here's another example. This uh, I believe goes to maybe a little bit more than, uh, than 15 meters. Uh, again, the uh, conventional time of flight sensor would give us no information in this kind of setting. Um, do I have, how much time do I have? Okay. Well, let, let, me, let me spend a couple more minutes on, on a slightly different problem that we've been looking at in the last year or so, which... Um, you have the room in case, yeah. No, 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 just a couple, just a couple. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, we've, been, we've been looking at, at uh, another set of imaging techniques that try to take advantage of, of the fact that even when we're in an environment like, like inside a room, or maybe outdoors at night, there's actually a lot of light around us. Uh, this light is, is actually artificial. It's coming from all the light sources. And typically when we, when we observe you know, our, our, these environments at sort of conventional time scales or you know, what we perceive, we don't, actually, uh, we don't actually perceive that this actually, these light sources are actually active and they flicker, they flicker in response to the uh, alternative current. So uh, this is what you would see if you were to image uh, the same environment, this is basically the city, uh, this city, uh, if, you, if you were to image the time scales on the order of, of uh, you know, a fraction of a millisecond. Okay, so you can see that the individual light bulbs, they flicker, and in fact, the, the, uh, if you were to observe light, light bulbs in, in, even inside a room, 
they would actually flicker in different ways depending on the characteristics of light emission. So we can actually take all this information and analyze it uh, by using, again, specialized imaging systems. And so from a distance, we can work out information about the electrical grid. We can work out, for example, what is the electrical phase connected to each light bulb. You can see here, for example, uh, that, that uh, all these green uh, light bulbs, they correspond to you know, street lights that are connected to the same phase of the grid. And similarly with red, with, with red and with yellow uh, bulbs. We can also determine things like the identity of a particular bulb. We can work out from, from the blade flickers whether the bulb is made of sodium, whether it's a sodium bulb, whether it's a metal halide, whether it's fluorescent, and so forth. And we can also use that information to um, sort of uh, analyze indoor scenes as well. So here's just a, a view of a corridor. If you were to actually uh, uh, image that at these high speeds, what you would see is that the lights in the environment, they flicker quite a lot, and we can use that information to separate the contribution coming from individual uh, phases of the electrical signal, and then use that for tasks such as creating new, 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 new views of the environment uh, as if there was a different set of light sources in that, in that environment that would be seen. And we can do this outdoors as well. So here's a conventional photo, but if you were to actually look at this at, at fast time scales, you would, what you would actually see is that there's a lot of flickering going on, and we can use that information again to uh, 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 capture images of the same environment under many different uh, illumination conditions. So here I'm showing you what uh, the environment would look like if we were just turning on a particular lab correspond to a particular phase or a particular type of lab. Uh, and so we are looking at, at ways to use this formation. One of them would be, for example, uh, in a cell phone photography setting, you try to take a picture, let's say, of a painting indoors where there is some glare coming from uh, some light bulb, and you can actually remove that glare uh, uh, automatically by analyzing the splitter. Uh, more generally, we're also trying to understand how the grid itself operates and, and uh, try to see very transient uh, effects that occur on the grid that uh, might uh, indicate uh, power surges or uh, uh, bulbs that have problems and so on and so forth. So again, this is another sort of direction that we're taking. It's not about 3D imaging yet, but we, we, we actually think that this type of information can be used for analyzing uh, scenes in 3D. Uh, and uh, that's going to be a, a, a part of what we're doing. Any questions? Nothing from the live chat. Anyone from the uh, uh Even in this room, uh, probably a third of these of these uh, sort of ceiling lamps are connected to different phases. So, like you know, you basically already have uh, for free pretty much uh, views of the environment under three different illumination conditions. Okay, so indeed, one of the basic uh, techniques in computer vision is to be able to take. Uh, uh, the use of an environment uh, 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 captured on different light sources and then use that to capture 3D information. So this is definitely something we, we should be able to do. This is more broader question. Uh, Icon X sort of has, I guess, some 3D recognition on the face. How does it relate to... Absolutely, yeah. So uh, that's a good question. So um, iPhone X is one of the first phones that actually uh, has an active source built in. So the, it sends light out. It's actually a set of dot patterns that, uh, that it sends onto the face. And uh, as long as you hold the phone close to your face, okay, you can, uh, you can afford to uh, maintain a relatively low power for your source. But the minute you take that phone farther away and you're outdoors, you can forget about getting any 3D information from it. So in some sense, the kinds of uh, uh, 3D sensing techniques that were that we're developing are for the next stage, where you could basically take your phone, integrate these sensors, they're low power, and they allow you to image in 3D at much greater distances than what current systems can do. Yeah. And the fact that you know we're basically working with uh, you know rolling shutter sensor, which is something totally standard in in, uh, in uh, you know, cell phone imaging, uh, is is good. I mean the fact that we're 
mean, uh, uh, active illumination is something that already exists on these phones. Uh, the systems that we're using are slightly different. They use MEMS uh, rather than uh, a static source. But uh, there are significant advantages to that kind of system, so that's what we're exploring. Thank you, Kyrus. Thank sure. you so much. And if you're willing to stay a bit longer, Sanya is in the room. So yes, Ready. I just want to say for two weeks from now, we do have one uh, talk lined up, but if anybody wants to volunteer, please go ahead and send me an email. I will be reaching out to some of you. A volunteer is best. Thank you. Can you do something on my end? Oh, it should be fine. Uh, mm -hmm. Just connect it, connect it. Yeah, the Uh, smart 
search. So when you want to have kind of like a graph-like query, and you want to search through a huge set of uh, movies to find a lot of the relevant bit. And the other part is describing the data. As you're watching the data, you want to generate you know, something that's relevant to what you describe in the story. Um, and we are planning to use neural nets to define on graphs. So, so that's one part that's kind of parsing the movies. Um, the problem with this data set is that it took us eight months to just collect this notation. So right now what we want to do is can we have a um, huge data set of notation that fit so we can all just kind of use that. And we are doing this via simulation. So what we want to do is we want to have people describe what they do in their phone, but they're saying and pick up any activity like making coffee, watching TV. Kind of write the steps that you do to, to do this uh, activity. And basically, what they want to do is generate a synthetic video of this guy um, actually performing this activity. Okay? And the nice thing about this data is that because it's going to be done in simulation, uh, in a good lighting intention, you can get all possible ground truth. And based on that, you can train. I hope so. <laughs> um, all right, so what do we actually want? So we've actually been um, collecting the following. We want to kind of have like a knowledge base uh, descriptions of everything that you do in your phone, this text. And then we want to have a simulator where you can actually take the description and just generate this video as automatic. Okay, and we do that via the presentation, which is kind of like code, right? So how do you do, how do you drive robots around? How do you drive a virtual character around? You need to generate some sort of a code and drive them around, right? So for example, an action, an object like find pot or grab pot, like this is uh, walk the faucet, right? These are very simple instructions and there are a lot of them already implemented in this uh, lean engine, right? So we just need to translate the description into something like that and then that So basically, what we did was just go to Mechanical Turk and ask people, you know, what are the different activities that you do in different rooms, and they describe them in text. And then the second part of the connotation is getting actual code, um, so getting this guy transcribed from scratch into code. Okay? And what we did is we used this MIT um, kind of like uh, game that uses uh, that they use a very simple interface where you basically have these blocks, you can drag and drop on the canvas, and then you have like a, a drop down menu where you pick up the correct things to fill. So it's actually very simple to write this code. Okay? So the annotator reads this description and then just kind of codes for us in this very simple language. Okay. These are just a couple of examples. And some are simple, some are going to be really complicated, like many classes here. So, one, very short. And now, basically, uh, we come up with this demo from the simulator. We actually spent a year doing the simulator because we wanted to implement uh, a lot of these low level actions, right? Like interaction, uh, switching on the laptop, right? And to animate how the laptop switches on. Or or you know, the guy opens a faucet to animate the water running, so that takes some time to actually implement. And we got a lot of this stuff implemented, but 14 different actions in a lot of different directions. And now what we want to do is take this code and then drive this guy around to actually generate this thing. And these are some examples. And now basically what we have is Take a description and then we have a neural net that reads a description and generates code. And 
and then drives the simulator. So we can actually just take any description and generate the base. Now this would be like a simulation of it. The graphics is not perfect, but I think it's okay to keep some neural nets different activity. got a bunch of different apartments. We have seven different ones um, with 22 rooms in it and a lot of different characters. And we do a lot of randomization in the process as well. So you can run out and actually generate video that are useful for training neural nets, right? And it just have the same description, always the same video. Right? You want to randomize both the apartment, the character, maybe even the way the character walks faster or slower, the way the type and so on. So you can generate a um, data set uh, where now you have um, you have your image, you your video, you have pose information that all you did is given by the simulator. You have semantic segmentation where the objects are instant segmentation. You have depth and so it's so branch root, which is super hard to get for like really videos. And moreover, you now have timestamps for each of those lines in the code. And I know exactly that. Walking to juice happen from here to here, and grabbing juice from here to here. Right? So you can actually now take you know, that's to actually do this parsing for you. Right? And use the semantic information and automatically detect the boundaries and the action and do like a full parsing for you. Um, so that's the plan for Kutisa is to do that parsing automatically. Right now we have, I don't know, 10,000 videos, and you can generate you know, many more. And we want to do basically this video, which is about one minute or two minutes long, and actually you know, have this parts. Right? So from here to here, there's this action happening. From here to here, there's this action. Maybe you have some semantic segmentation in, in each frame. Um, and for that, you need to deal with untrained videos, so really long videos, as well as have some presentations that are very efficient because there's a lot of data. Right? So just storing all this. Neural net feature and this is, is, is a big deal. Um, like just running you know, hours and hours of video um, in this net is just taking a long time. So that's one more thing that you want to explore here. I think that that's it. Pretty cool. Yeah. And then uh, Tarkovsky and Pi. Yeah? Uh, movies. Tarkovsky and Pi, right? Tarkovsky is that uh, wonderful Russian uh, filmmaker. You know? I cannot make sense of the movies. <laughs> anyway, I'm just being a bit silly now. And Prime is that movie with, with uh, this. Anyway, what's it you'll see? There's a, like a diagram of all the timelines that go through. It's like really confusing. Anyway, it's pretty nice stuff. Hey, we have any questions? Okay, two questions. questions. First of all, one of the first graphs we showed the network and you sort of have the representation of father. How do you detect or how do you determine some of the you know, fathership or mothership relationship? I mean, this was all branch root, so we're now working on actually detecting that. Um, but that, that's something that is, it is perceivable in a movie, because it is perceivable by humans. So it should be possible to get that based on both conversations and visual information. Right? So what we're doing now is building these nets that encode graphs from the beginning to the time timeline, and they use both like the visual information and the subtitles, which is essentially dialogue. And a lot of that is, is spoken. Like in movies, at least in the beginning of the movie, you kind of spill it out for the audience. So, so now the second question, and it really tells I'm not, you know, I understand you do all the simulations, but I'm, I'm curious as to all the applications you can do. So, you know, whether I'm understanding correctly, so you create the simulations so that you can train our own network so they can identify what's going on in real movies. Is that the thing? So you're using exactly. our own networks to create simulations to train our own networks to... That's right. That's so we want to go from a description of what you do in a home to actually generate that video, right? So you can actually generate videos of everything that you do in your home. 
and that gives you a huge data set um, with all these grants where it is impossible to collect otherwise. So the biggest data set right now that exists on that is just people recording themselves at home, and there's about 27 videos, and there's 10,000 videos. And very, there's very little, very little branch I think you just get some text and so on. Um, but here you have everything that you want to train this. And the hope is that if you're smart about it, then you can translate these models from simulated videos to real videos of people doing stuff in their home. Right, so you can imagine some application for the elderly, right, where you have a monitoring system, seeing what they're doing. But in reality, you could also do it to uh, make problems with obsolete, so they just need the script and then you can generate right. anything you want to That's also something that we're going to So your training videos now require text description, so is it uh, zip up? Text, yeah. Text. It's just text description. I mean, it's obviously not perfect, and we're limited by the actions we have implemented in the game engine, mm -hmm. so it's not a whole lot of things, but we'll do. So if you give people comments and you tell them just narrate what you're doing. Would that be if something? You know what? If you gave people cameras and said, you know, just narrate what you're doing, like just say what you're doing, as opposed to typing it. Yeah, that, yeah. That we, then you need something speech to text, yeah. which but is a little bit noisy, but possibly get something. Yeah. 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 Uh, we have one question from uh, Alexandra. Um, so, Sanya, thank you for the presentation. How can we get the models and data so we can begin doing performance analysis? Synthetic data from the simulations will be fine. We can give you the videos, but we don't. We have some metrics that don't work very well yet. So that's something that I want to still work on in this project. And there's a lot of networks that already exist, so you could imagine just taking them off the shelf. Um, I'm not sure they exactly they would do exactly this problem. So I I might start with. Uh, an existing data set that is short, like short video clips and some existing models, and then we can do something more complicated as, as part of this project. Just to add to that, uh, uh, I mean, we do have a, an effort to, to collect various networks. We're going to be releasing those under Cohesa. These are not stuff we do, it's stuff we collect. And, but this has to be a continuous process, collecting stuff. But we're going to share with Alex, uh, Sasa pretty soon with those, whatever we have. I am looking for volunteers to help with that because we have a list of things to, that we want to get, and there's a process to convert everything to something you can run for experiments. So. Yeah, so I just had a question. I think it's sort of related to, to Michael's question as well. So, you, in the second half of your presentation, you really focus a lot on the actions, but the first graphs you showed had like things like emotions. So, I guess what what do you envision sort of connect? Because the emotions are really important to understanding. Yeah, we the don't have them well. yet. So, one of the things that we want to explore is also have multiple actors in the simulation and animate the face as well. Right now, it's not animated, but um, that's something that we want to do. In the end, we want to generate a movie like that, but we're not there yet. To get there. Uh, one more dumb question. So, in this more computer systems question, have you sort of extrapolated if you want to? I assume you're going to need petabytes of data to. Track of what you know, keep all these uh, movie segments that, that you guys will search through, etc. Have you figured out how much storage space you need for this in reality that you could search through in quasi real time? I mean, right now we have, like for the first part, we have 250 movies, and each is about 700 megabytes. So the data itself is quite large, and if you want to store features for each movie, it, just, it, can, it, it cannot scale. So the current method cannot cannot do that. Right? So we need a more efficient implementation. You cannot just take each frame and store the features on this. You need a terabyte to terabyte. Well, terabyte is not much. That's very little. But, uh, no, no, no. Like, how many exabytes do you need? <laughs> I don't know. So this is data center scale stuff. That's what you need. Right, we can compute, right? It's like every movie is about 200,000 frames. Maybe you need even need every frame. 40,000 times, I don't know, features you want to use. Okay, dimensions for each one. It's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, maybe, maybe we should stop here today. Thank you all for staying for today. I think it was very interesting. At least it was pretty exciting for me. And we're going to meet again in two weeks from now. 
and uh, we have one presentation lined up, and I'm sure we're going to get more. So thank you all again. Uh, we do have other cookies, so there's like this tremendous amount of, I think, 58 cookies.